Um, well, welcome everybody to our latest episode 14 of the Edge Grip podcast. And we are very lucky today to have Dale Quarterly, who has a fascinating career in both motorcycling and cars that uh, we'd love to speak to. Dale, thank you for making it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And, and we're speaking to you despite of your career in cars. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. Trust me. <laughs> And Dale is actually uh, is the I don't know if, if if it's the best title to have or the worst title to have, but the winniest, winniest, winning, winningest uh, privateer, winningest, winningest privateer in AMA. So you you won uh, you won the most amount of races, championships, not being sponsored by anyone. So not championships, not in superbike, anyways. Um, it, it basically was. You know, if there was five factory bikes and five privateers, I'd be the top privateer, right? Just about weekly. So I was the top privateer in the country for years. Um, Tom Kip, all those guys, right, had to come up through the ranks when I was running. So you get to run with all those guys, too, battling for top privateer. Did you ever sneak up in the middle of the night? Nothing, by the way. You ever sneak up in the middle of the night and, and took some parts from the official teams? <laughs> uh, no, I wanted to, though. <laughs> one year I was my father was screaming at me and we this was I think 84 and he wanted me to claim the carburetors off of uh, Merkel's bike because he had $25,000 um, VF 750 magnesium body carburetors that are probably worth 40 grand and it was only like 5,000 bucks to protest him <laughs> and they had to give them to you and then I could sell them for 20 grand <laughs> sell them back to him for 20 grand and I'm like, Dad, that's committing political suicide. You can't do that. He's like, we don't care. We did, they're, not, they're not helping us anyways. And I'm like, no, we can't do that. There's shit we can do, but that's not it. <laughs> yeah. Good business scheme. Uh, imagine Scott Russell just gets up in the morning, goes to check what's going on with the bike, and there's a swing arm missing. And yeah, that'd standing, be awesome. Standing on cinder blocks, and then you right. know the, the swing arm is on your, on your uh, bike. With different stickers. Scott Russell, there. my father's name was Herb. My father owned a go kart mini bike shop when we were younger, so he really knows racing. So somehow him and Scott Russell get along, which I don't know how we even understood what Scott was saying, but that's a whole other story. And um, Scott would always, when he was coming, like, one of these days I'm going to be your kid. My father's like, there's no way. He won't let it happen. It wasn't until he got a factory ride till he finally beat us, and then he just kept going. Right, he never stopped. So, he, which he deserves everything he got. He he really worked at it. Yeah, I think at some point he replaced Kevin Schwantz even on uh, the RGV five hundred. Yes, yeah, but I'm not sure you replace Kevin Schwantz as much. As Kevin Schwantz decided after the rainy situation. You know, I've had enough. I think he broke both his arms, Schwantz. And then Duan came but over. But that's and, why. Yeah. I mean, if you listen to all the stories now, right, he just, all the motivation was gone and he wasn't focused. And he started getting really hurt. Yeah. Right? Anyways. Yeah. That's his story. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> so you spent 13 years racing in AMA, obtaining championships in 1988, winning the AMA Ballad of the Twins title and two AMA Endurance Championships. Uh, Three endurance championships. Yeah, was a part of two championship winnings. I mean, endurance racing teams, Lockhart Racing in 1987 and Dutchman Racing in 1989 and 1990. That that's right, okay. right. 1993, and that's that's. Uh, I think that's what everybody still talks about uh, the 1993 win. But you placed uh, second in the AMA Superbike National Championships with Team Mirage. Uh, including a historic AMA Superbike National win at Mid Ohio. Um, now, there's a lot of material online about that win, so I'm, I don't know if we should get into it because everybody, everybody that that uh, that wants to know about it, I mean, there's there's enough things out there. But you know, in a couple of words, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure the stories get better and better every time you tell them. Yeah, I'm sure. So let's let's change it up a little. My son, Alex, is doing some flat track motorcycle racing and he's slowly becoming really good. Like we could go to a national and qualify. He's he's really good. 
So he's at the races and people walk up and say, hey, do you know Deal Quarterly? And depending on what mood he's in, he'll either say, yeah, that's my father. Or he's an asshole. Okay? <laughs> depending on what mood he's in. And then the conversation goes from there. And the, most people stick up for me and say, no, he's a really nice guy. He'll sit and talk to me at the races, blah, blah, blah. Well, he proceeds to tell me that these guys tell the story of mid-Ohio. And they're telling him the story. And he sits and listens to it, right? He's heard it 50,000 times. But he sits and listens to it and then comments a little, right? Well, this is going on for a couple of years. It's happening. So it finally dawned on me, and I said something to Alex about it. I'm like, Alex, you don't get the story. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, the story they're told. He's like, yeah, man, I've heard it 50,000 times. I'm like, but you never listen to them. You're not really hearing the story. He's, and he asked, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you're forgetting that that guy was 12 years old, 13, 14 years old. He was a kid with his father at the motorcycle races. He didn't know me. He doesn't even know motorcycles. I said, granted, I was Teenage Mini Turtles, so he's rooting for me anyways. I said, but as the day wore on, it became obvious, you know, I... I never went back farther than fourth, I think. And um, our goal was stay in the top four or five, third of the way through the race, third to go, then go. It was time to go and then try and get those guys done that we knew in the long run. We were really good in the long run. So um, we just hung up front all day. I wasn't trying to lead. I was just trying to run with their front runners, right? So... When those guys tell the story, they're all excited about, yeah, and he's doing this, and he passed Miguel, and he did this, and he passed them. And the next thing you know, he comes through the thing, and we thought everybody else crashed because there's a giant gap. And the next thing you know, he's like five seconds ahead. He's all by himself, and there's 50,000 people standing up, and they're all yelling and screaming, and he's telling the story. And I'm like, but I'm going to say it again, Alex. He was 12. He's telling you a story from 30 years ago. That's how much it's in his brain, Right. It's a 30 year old story. I don't remember being 12. I don't mind telling a story, right? So it, it's a, it was a way bigger deal than we even comprehend at the time, is what I'm trying to say, right? And people that were there felt like they were part of it, right? Because I was a privateer. They could come up and talk to you, they could walk in the garage, and, you know, I'd sit and chit chat with them and ask for an autograph, right? I wasn't a factory guy with a stringer across the front of the garage. You can't cross this line, right? So it was it was a cool deal. Is really what I'm trying to say, right? And and I still we still hear about it, right? It's kind of a folklore story. It, and the last piece on that is that was the biggest AMA superbike had ever been. True. As far as riders, factory riders on the grid, that was the biggest it had ever been, and they all finished. It wasn't that guys fell down or oil happened or it rained, everybody was running, right? That finally, when I finally did it, it was 100%. We did it, right? We as a team did it. Yeah, you, you beat, I mean, I can't think of a, of a field that would, that had heavier names than, than the names that you beat. Right. Even, even if there was bigger guys, there was the most of them, right? So, so it was good. Anyways, it was good. And it was good that we beat, we leased motors from Kawasaki, And, um, and I beat the factory team with lease equipment, right? Actually, I did it three years in a row, 93, 94, and 95. I beat the factory teams with lease equipment. I even beat Farachi with, he did the motors, but we did everything else. So that was cool too. Amazing story. So what got you into motorcycling in the first place? What got your passion going? I go-kart raced when I was a kid because dad owned the go-kart mini bike shop. And then um, he sold it, and we had a used car lot. One of my buddies kept bugging me, and he kept showing me pictures of Cooley and those guys on the Katana and all that stuff, and Eddie Lawson, and uh, we had to do this, we had to do this, we had to do this. And I um, kept on saying, yeah, whatever, like blowing him up. Like, we can't afford to do this. And finally, he's like, no, we got to do this, and I'm going to go buy a bike next week. And I'm like, okay, well, you're going to buy a bike. I'm going to go buy a bike. So I bought a bike off of John Betancourt's father, Dick Betancourt, which was the Honda dealer in Massachusetts. And um, I started on a CB900F. Three years later, I was number seven in the country in AMA Superbike. 
because I already knew how to race. I just had to learn how to ride. I knew how to set them up. I knew most of the pieces. I just had to find a good engine builder, um, which was Harry's Machine Parts in Framingham. Rick Stetson was a drag race guy. He built the speed, and we had the rest. It was, I mean, we were, it was good right from the get-go. So. so what were the similarities between racing carts and racing bikes? What's the same? What's different? The the engines, the lines, the horsepower, how to get the most out of what you were doing at the moment. Um, my brother raced too, so he would come to the races with me and watch and tell me what I was doing wrong. We'd sit and talk about it, and sometimes, as you can imagine, on a privateer bike, the you know, I didn't have the suspension those guys had. I mean, I had forks from Lindemann that were revalved for 700 bucks, and Merkel had $25,000 shower forks on, right? So some stuff I just could not do. I had to find a way around problems or bumps, but we would sit and chit-chat at the end of every session and hone in on what it took. But we both, we both knew how to race, and we both knew how to get the most out of what we had. We didn't worry about what they had. We worried about what we had, and we got the most out of it, right? And I, to this day, I'm 63 years old. I still make a career out of doing it. I get the most out of whatever I'm doing at the moment. I don't worry about this is faster or that's faster. There's nothing I can do about it, right? This is what I got at the moment. Deal with it. That's yeah. a good management philosophy. I think that could apply to many areas. Outside everything. I mean, too. every business you do, right? I mean, people just, people want to complain. He's got this, he's got that, right? But he's got a better car. Well, great. Work more. Shut up and work more, right? <laughs> now, now, understand, now understand why you, you were always a privateer and not, not a prima donna that worked for the racing teams because those guys love to complain. So... The Harley guys used to call me all the time, even before they started the Harley program. And then after a while, I thought they were going to hire me. Then after a while, I realized they're basically just picking my brain, right? So I stopped talking to them. <laughs> and one day, one of the mechanics walks up and he's talking to me and he was so mad. And, and I'm, I'm kind of laughing, looking at him. I'm like, well, then just quit, right? Why deal with the stuff that's going on? Just quit. He's like, but well, that's not the point. Like, what is the point? He says, we've brought it up a couple of times. Why don't we just hire Quarterly, get him over here. He'll help us fix this. And the answer was always no, and I couldn't figure out why. And I said, and I said to the guy, you know, I don't know. I can't figure out why they won't do it. He says, oh, I know why. I'm like, why? He says, because you're going to cause dissension in the ranks. And I'm like, I don't even know what that word means. He's like, dissension, meaning half of the team is going to want to do what you want to do. The other half of the team is going to do what they want to do. But we're going to be going in two different directions. And your way is going to work. And their way is going to look like shit. And they're all going to be mad and upset. So they won't do it because of that reason. And I'm like, okay, that's a good reason, right? Because it's, it's going to happen. Right. I don't know. I, know I mean, if, if you're on a team, you want to you want to win races, and you do whatever it takes to win races. So I guess they didn't want. But to... most guys don't know. And this is a this is definitely an ego statement. Most guys don't know how to accomplish that, or what they need to do to accomplish that. And I learned, and I want to say it was from my father. Your job isn't to fix everything. I'm not that smart. My job is to not go and revalve the rear shock. My job is to go out on the racetrack, figure out what it's doing, walk over to the shock guy, Jim Lindemann in the early days, Conwell in today's day and age, and tell him what it's doing. And he's going to say, oh, well, that's this. And give me some ideas of different ways to fix it. And let me choose which direction I think fits what I'm trying to say try it right and if it's way better but we still need more okay now we have a direction right if it's way worse then i'm complaining about the wrong thing then i need to go learn right it's not the motorcycle it's me causing this problem then i need to change my mindset and do something else but it's pretty easy to find a direction right 
and I, when we had the road race team with uh, Bob Robbins a few years back, I would say to the kids all the time, it's a triangle, right? Once you find two points, it's easy to find the third one, right? The fourth one's the problem. They're like, it's a triangle. It only has three points. I'm like, where did you start from? You didn't start in the triangle. You didn't even know where the triangle is. They're like, well, now you're just being an idiot. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> That's my point, right? Is finding where the triangle is. Once you get over there and find a point, then you find the second one. The third one's a piece of cake, right? It's connecting the dots. That's what you're trying to accomplish. That's what racing is, right? It's the least, my favorite saying, the least worst handling motorcycle wins the race. Of course, now it's the least worst handling race car wins the race. It's not the best handling one. There's no such thing. Yeah. It's the least yeah. worst handling wins. So Sometimes you don't know how much you can get out of, out of your equipment until you see someone else that's doing it. Uh, and, and then you go like, hey, wait a minute. If he's doing it on this, I can do it on this. On this, and then you try, and it works. I mean, you can go back and watch races. I got a story. We probably don't have time for it, but um, and I'm passing somebody on the outside, Miguel at Charlotte on the outside. The announcer's saying, "I don't even know why he's doing this. You can't pass on the outside and turn one. This, this he, he's going to be offline." And and of course, I pass him on the outside. Now I'm on the inside for the next turn, and I get by him. And he, his comeback is. Well, if anybody going to prove me wrong, it's quarterly. Well, if you watch the video, the very next lap, Miguel changes his line and moves over where I was, right? I couldn't do what they were doing because I didn't have their suspension. I had to find a way around the bumps. And my, my way was offline, but it was way less bumps, right? Mm -hmm. So in the long run, it was faster. It's, but again, it's connecting the dots, right? You can't stick to, no, this is how you do it. It's... It's whatever you need to do that day. That's how you're going to do it. Yeah, and, and you're racing against intelligent people. They see what you're doing, and, and they see if it works, and then they'll, they'll do the same thing. So you have to kind of keep your, keep your cards closer to your chest. Right, 100%. So, all good. Well, that, was, that was an interesting point, what you said, because I, 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 like a lot of track riders, find a hard time giving feedback to anybody who's adjusting my bike just because of lack of expertise and experience but but thinking of it the way you framed it is if you made the change and it's worse then you're the problem and then go back to what it was and then figure something how to ride so around it is a good I, approach i used to help i was kind of the rider coach in the day right before we had rider coaches before there was such a thing and um one that trips my mind all the time is Dave Sadowski is at Road Atlanta. He's on Yoshimaru Suzuki, and he's super struggling. And he finally comes over, chit-chats with me. He's like, hey, I got a problem. I'm like, what's the problem? I can't get down the hill. And we tried this, and we've done this, and he's telling me all about the technical stuff they've done. And I'm just sitting there laughing. that I'm working on my motorcycle, right? And he finally says, so what's the answer? And I said, well, it's not going to matter. You're not going to do it anyways because you're too fucking stupid. And he says, well, just tell me the answer. Then I'll decide how stupid I am. I said, the answer is, why don't you try to let go of the throttle for a second? And then floor it again and stop trying to be a man and go down the hill wide open. It's the old gravity cavity at Road Atlanta, not the new sissy course they run. And um, so he's like, well, what else do I need to do? I'm like, that's it just before it starts shaking and wobbling and trying to kill you, just crack the throttle off. But you got to do it before it starts and wait a second and go back to wide open. It'll go down the hill like butter. He comes back, he freaking sits on the pole, comes back and he's like, now that was stupid. I'm like, meaning it was easy. He's like, easy. I could ride it one handed after that. All they had to do is crack the throttle, right? but you have a tendency to completely overthink it, right? It's always the motorcycle's fault that there's no way the motorcycle is going to make a turn and go down a hill and not get weirded out, right? I mean, just think about it, right? There's no weight on the suspension. So, yeah. so back to that piece, right? The other piece is, is 
this is a hard lesson to learn and it's a hard lesson to teach because you don't know where people's percentage is. But if you're out riding at a hundred percent, you have 0% left to focus with, right? You're spending a hundred percent of your time trying to stay alive and not see Elvis. That's what your goal is, right? Don't see Elvis, stay alive. But because of that, you have no idea what you're doing or what it's doing. You don't have time to pay attention to it. You're trying to stay alive, right? Don't see Elvis. Don't see Elvis. Don't see Elvis. If you would just slow down to 90% in that turn, especially whatever that turn is, in this case, going into gravity cavity at Rio Atlanta, if you had just stopped and thought for one second and paid attention to what the motorcycle was doing, he would have felt it come up, come up as it's going over the crest, and then it starts wiggling. And it's like he could have just drugged the rear brake and it probably would have helped, right? None of us used a rear brake then, so I didn't dare to bring that up because we didn't use them. I'm afraid they'd break off the motorcycles, right? None of us used them back then. So anyways, it's that's the other part, right, is you gotta you got to know where to take your thought and get the most of it. Right? The best wording I can think of. No. Well, while we're on that topic, uh, what would be your advice to track riders who are trying to better themselves? Don't talk to the idiot next to you. <laughs> Do you want me to say Please. it again? Don't talk Please. to the idiot next to you. This way either. Or that side. Go find the fastest guy there and buy him friggin' lunch. I did it with my son even. Go talk to those guys. The idiot next to you, when you ask him tire pressure, oh, I ran this. It's just because that's what somebody else told him. He doesn't freaking know, right? You got to go talk to the tire guys. You got to go talk to the, find the fastest guy there, buy him lunch. I'm not kidding. And chit chat with him. And in two seconds, you'll drop seconds, right? The second thing is trying to be Mark Marquez is impossible. That I don't agree with the new style motorcycle riding with the freaking, you know, chain on your wrist and trying to ride that they put handlebars on it for a reason not so you can rest your friggin' chin on your wrist right sit up and ride this thing like you're going down pit road and every single guy will speed up every person i help when i go to the vintage races or i go run my motor america junior cup team that's the first thing i get the kids to do is sit up and learn how to ride learn what the handlebars actually do and then from there we can tuck back in but we got to learn how to ride it first, right? Yeah, those we could go on for hours on this subject. Th those motor and I'm bikes get more and more excited. Yeah, they, they do it also because of the arrow. The arrow is. Well, who cares about arrow? Yeah. It, it, right? It, it, think of it. Think of it like this. Let's let's take two motorcycles. We're going to take a Yamaha R6 makes 110 horse, right? And we got a Yamaha R1 that makes 180 horse. That. Either one of them, when you crack the throttle open, it's got so much power, it's picking the front end up. And as soon as the front end comes up, it's not turning anymore, right? It's going right to the grass on the outside of the racetrack. So our job is take this 180-horse motorcycle and get it to the other end of the straightaway. It's not a road race track. It's drag strips connected by turns. It is not a road race track. Your job is to get it stopped get it turned and get it going again. And as you get it going again, you'll beat the guy at the other end of the straightaway every single time, right? Don't mess with the throttle. It's we're, it's touch the gas, on the gas, wide open. Touch the gas, on the gas, wide open. If you're going, rrr, 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 you get on the gas way too soon, right? Touch the gas, on the gas, wide open. That's how they should be ridden. I think it's that, 180 horse, right? I think I think a lot of aspects of what the top riders are doing is imitating each other, even if it works or not. And sometimes it, it's a psychological warfare because Marquez was beating Rossi uh, when he was doing that elbow thing, uh, and um, that's why everybody else changed their style. It's the same with the leg dangle. Uh, the leg dangle drives me insane. Yeah, I can see the leg dangle that it would help in certain situations. The local guy is just doing it. He's not really making it work for him, right? He's just doing it. Yeah. Just because, right? He did it once and it kind of felt cool, so he keeps doing it. 
Yeah. I, I think the best contribution of the leg dangle is showing everybody where you put your weight when you break because uh, a lot of people want like, oh, put it on your knees or your outside knee. And uh, you see the leg dangle, where, where do they put the weight? It's on the handlebar. That's what I was going to say. Right. I mean, it ends up you putting a load in the bars where they belong in the first place. Right. We covered that already. Yeah. They sit up and ride the motorcycle. Think about this. This is my stupid mentality, right? It's the same with a big truck. This guy got paid 9 million yen, which is only 20 bucks, right? 9 million yen to design a motorcycle. And in the midst of designing it, the first thing he did was cover the outside. He's going to make it look cool as hell, right? So when you look at it, oh, this thing is so cool. Look at it. I love the way the headlights and the body and the seat. Wow, ready? So cool. Then he designed ergonomics. He designed the way you sit on the seat, the way the foot pegs, the way the shifter, brake lever, the handlebars are. He designed the ergonomics, right? Then he designed the way the throttle works and the levers work and all that, right? And it's all supposed to end intermingle. And when he gets done, he looks at his sheet and says, oh, look, um, 7,000 yen over budget. Somehow I got to get rid of parts. I got to get rid of pieces. Well, the easiest thing to get rid of is the freaking handlebars. Right? You get all that crap, the clip-ons, all the pieces, all the switches, all that, right? You can put all the switches in one little cluster in the center of the console to make it 10 times easier. You get rid of all those wires, all those connectors, right? He'd be 20 million yet ahead if he just got rid of the handlebars. They don't use them anyway, so they're chin on their wrist, right? <laughs> the handlebars are still on a motorcycle, and every motorcycle ever made, even to today, right, 2024, the 2025s are still out. But they have fucking handlebars, <laughs> They're handlebars for a reason, right? If we could have got rid of them, we would have got rid of them, <laughs> right? They're around there for a reason, but nobody uses them, right? You go look at their hands when they come in. You can tell they're not using them. I can tell someone's not riding right, and you can ask Dallas Daniels this. We're at the track, and I'm, and I'm freaking screaming at him, and I actually have him wired up. And I'm trying to get him to do stuff, and he's just not doing it. And he's, but I got him wired up. I got the NASCAR radios on him the whole bit, right? So when he's out riding his motorcycle, I'm talking to him live. And I'm like, Dallas, you got to get off the seat. Dallas, you got to get off the seat. The next lap, Dallas, you got to get off the seat. I finally look at his father and say, I'll get him off the seat this time. And before he come, even comes in the site, I'm looking at the stopwatch. Just before he even comes in the site, I can see him. I'm screaming at him at the top of my lungs and every swear word I could possibly imagine is coming out of my mouth. And I'm screaming at him to get off the F and C, you stupid moron, loser, <laughs> like every word I can possibly think of. And you can see Dallas in one motion say, screw you. I'll show you that this doesn't work is what he's thinking. And all of a sudden his butt moves on the seat. And he almost goes through the grass on the inside of the racetrack. He actually has to stand the motorcycle back up to not go through the grass. And he almost goes off the grass on the outside of the racetrack. The very next lap, he dropped a full second. Yeah, it's... All because he moved his ass six more inches on the seat. Because he moved his ass six more inches on the seat, his right knee dug into the tank. And because his right knee dug into the tank, now he could use his arms. And he was all that weight on the inside bar, right, handlebar. All the way to the inside bar, the thing just hooked this immediate left on him. Like he could, he was having problems making the turn before. And this lap, he almost went through the grass. Yeah, it's it's one of the right. first things that they told me that the triangle of where you put your elbows uh, and where you put your body is is the angle of the force that you put through the handlebars. And if you're if you're more parallel to the ground with the the elbow and uh, you just push forward instead of pushing down, if that makes sense. So, then you you lose you use less weight to counter steer. I don't know who's listening to us today, right? But I would be willing to bet if they call me up and I go to the racetrack and they give me an honest fifteen minutes, I will beat anybody who calls me every single time. If they give me an honest 15 minutes, right? And do what I want done. Don't combine my stuff with your stuff. We're going to do it my way, my stuff. You do it my way, my stuff. I don't care who you are. You'd be 198 years old. I'll beat you whatever lap time you're doing. My way will be faster, right? In my way is this simple. 
however you drove down pit lane, that's your riding position. All you're allowed to do is pick your ass up, move it over, and sit back down. Make the turn. When you get that turn done, pick your ass up, move it over, sit back down. When you get to the next turn, pick your ass up, move it over, sit back down. That's all you're allowed to do. You don't need allowed to tuck in on the straightaway. However you left pit road, I don't care what motorcycle you're on, that's how you're going to ride it. Down the straightaway, Chuckawalla, I don't care what racetrack we're talking about, you're going to ride it sitting up. And if you sit up and learn how to use the handlebars, within one full session, you'll be faster than you've ever gone. And how, I've yet to lose. Okay. How hard can you ride that. how hard can you ride the front end like that? And so you push the front wheel out from under it because you're finally making the handlebars work. Okay. You can go I got pictures um of me on my four hundred and uh, I'm completely up up and off the my motorcycles over here someplace, right? Off the motorcycle making it turn, right? I've got the bar down, now I'm using load to finish the turn. Right. You can't lay it over anymore. It's not a MotoGP bike that'll lean over 70 degrees, right? You got to do it with some body English. That, right. It, and I agree. If we were going to go ride a MotoGP bike, you need to ride like MotoGP guys. That's a different story, right? It's 70 degree lean angle. You take my 82 Kawasaki, it's got a 30 degree lean angle, right? Yeah. You just can't ride it like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that, unless you're dragging body parts, really, you don't need to do all this monkey yeah. business. Yeah, which is basically you under the motorcycle, right? I, I yeah. Th- yeah. I, I so think speaking those... of moving over on the seat, because I got this philosophical debate with uh, two different accomplished trainers, and one of them says, when you move, you rotate around the tank, and the other says, absolutely not. You got to move flat Square. side to side. Yeah, up over down. Square, Square, up, over, down. If your hips are rotated forward, you're not pushing on the inside bar. You got your uh-huh. left knee up against the tank, and then your left knee's telling it to go right. Your hand's trying to tell it to go left. So what does it do? It goes straight, right? Because you're telling it to do two different things. That's what getting off the seat, the right amount helps accomplish. Then when you get off the seat, the right amount, you can't get your left knee into the tank anymore. And... Now, because you're off the seat so much, your right knee is holding you from falling off the motorcycle. So your right knee is buried into the right side of the tank because we're going left. So everything's telling it to go left. Every fiber of your being is telling this motorcycle to go left. And it just goes woof right around the turn, right? Half the amount of effort. And I learned a lot of what I know from endurance racing. Right? We used to ride an hour at a time on... 420 ton motorcycles that weighed that had 180 horse right but they were dinosaur motorcycles so they're just ripping the tires apart and you had to learn how to get speed not wear yourself out and not chunk a rear tire right you know it took a while to pull those three worlds together so eric bostrom wins this one that was that was his right. theory and, and he also is the guy who said there's two throttle positions wide open or closed if you're I messing around already, between right? you, <laughs> yeah, yeah i guess you guys would agree on a lot wait wait who, who was the guy who was the guy that lost because eric bostrom there's actually three throttle positions there's closed there's zero and then there's wide open so zero would be you go down gear down gear down gear and then you crack the throttle back open to whatever the motorcycle's not going faster. It's not slowing down. It's at it's zero. You get what I'm saying? Right. Zero acceleration it's or zero. deceleration. And then now you have control of the motorcycle, right? It's in your hand. When you're off throttle, you don't know what it's doing. You got to crack the throttle back open to have control. And then once right. you have control, then you can decide what to do next, right? Which should be basically right from there to wide open. Not in one bang, but... Brrr, Right, right to wide open. Yeah, yeah, and I think he says it that way because all of us newbies, well, fifteen-year-old newbies, but still slow, um, tend to pedal the throttle a lot. Uh, and so he's, he's trying right. to exaggerate the other way. If you sit on the side of the racetrack and go watch practices, which most—that's another thing—most track guys don't do. 
they come in, they want to talk about how cool they just were and how cool their new pink helmet is and the new fluorescent shield and, you know, the sparklers on their rims. Um, they don't go out and watch practice. You go out and watch an amateur practice and watch those guys ride around and you get a hundred percent see what you're doing wrong. Right. But that yeah. if, if I go help somebody, even a top expert, I make them go watch the amateur practice. Right. Cause those guys are just doing it to the nth degree. So it really shows up. You can see how much I call it coast time, how much coast time they have. Right. They're not really on the brakes. They're not really stopping. They never really turn. Then they don't really get on the gas either, right? It just takes them forever to do this turn that should be, you know, wah, bum, 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 wah, and gone again. You know, it's wing, 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 wah. come on, turn, come on, turn, come on, turn, because they don't know how to make a turn. Come on, turn, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, I can go. Uh, oh, no, I can't go yet. It's going the wrong way. Uh, come on, turn, come on, turn. Uh, and they go again, right? I mean, it's you have a solar eclipse in the time it takes them to make turn one. <laughs> right? All because they're doing it at the wrong time, right? Yeah, they're not making it turn, making it turn. Thanks for making us feel bad. <laughs> that's a, that, that's how Gal lies. Yeah, we're all there at one point. I ha- I was lucky. I had the Penguin Widen School. Jerry Wood, which is uh, Woodcraft. Woodcraft, Eric Wood owns Woodcraft. It's his father started the Penguin School, one, one of the started creators. And um, so they used to come and help me all the time. And I used to think it was because I was fast, but come to find out is so I didn't kill somebody. Because <laughs> I was just on the gas, like if I refused to slow down. So, um, but they used to help. So I, I learned a ton from those guys. And, and when we became pros, I used to bring Randy Remper and myself used to go back before Loudon and teach the pre-national course. And we'd have shit, a hundred students would have to subdivide students between us. And then as the day were on, we'd swap off students that like I could tell students that wouldn't listen to me. They didn't like my point blank way of teaching. I'd push him off on Randy because he was nice, yes sir, no sir, and I'd take his guys and switch off. So that was always a good deal. Yeah, I have a feeling you don't hand out eighth place trophies. No, <laughs> no. But I'm not picking on you about it either. If and I do, I'm hoping I'm trying to make you laugh so you'll do something about it, not cry. But sometimes I have to make you cry so you do something about it. Right? So you guys watch. Uh, What's that show called? Fire Wars? Fire Rescue? Fire Rescue on TV? How about the the, the cooking show? Where he's yes, yelling at the, the British one. I've seen Yes. Man, I that's what I'm like. I haven't watched that's cable. That's what I can get like, right? It's just somehow we're making this happen. I haven't watched cable what TV in like 20 on? years, though. It's it's yeah. all it's all internet now, so <laughs> it's all Netflix. Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, that cooking yeah. show is on Netflix, actually. Is it? Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're, we're, this is a great writing lesson section. Um, so let me ask some more here because this is we're getting some gold that, that people are going to love listening to. Uh, what's it? So, what's the best way to learn a racetrack and and get your markers? And what what markers do you think are like you need to learn first and challenge yourself with? Because often they people, talk about pushing the brake marker, right? Yeah. People keep talking about uh, Colin Edwards says this and Marquez says this and this guy says that. and We all learned it from the first guy that raced in 1912. Had the exact same problem, 1908, that we have, right? They couldn't stop. They wouldn't turn. They wouldn't go, right? It's always the same three problems. To me, the best one is until you get in your head, a road race track is drag strips connected by turns. You're never going to go fast. Not really fast, right? That's the first one. The second one is the exit of the turn is everything, not the entrance and not the apex. And think about it. 
if you get on the gas too soon in any turn, what happens next? Where do you end up every single time? In the dirt. Right, in the dirt, on the outside of the racetrack, right? So, obviously, the apex wasn't the situation. It's when can you get back on the gas to go down the straightaway? So, it's the exit of the turn that matters. So, when you track an exit backwards, that's your apex. Not coming to that point. It's that point forward does that make sense so that point forward meaning if you pay attention to coming to an apex would be due now i'm at this spot you get on the gas and what happens right the thing rockets the outside of the racetrack you're in the dirt again you got to get it to finish that last little piece of the turn and look at the apex mark you've got picked out and get to get yourself there right without going off the racetrack without having to let go of wide open throttle that that's the part that matters. And then just keep working it backwards from there, right? Okay, now that I've got exit to exit, sorry, apex to exit, now that I have that, I'm going to do brake marker to down gear to apex. I'm going to work on those three spots, right? I already have apex to exit, so as long as I don't change something up, I've always got a good exit. I just got to fix my entrance, right? And the biggest problem people make is, and one of the biggest problems is, because they got their freaking chin on their wrist, they can't see over the windshield, and they can't see far enough ahead to see, even see the turns coming. So then they get down in the turn, and I called it, I always call it the oh shit zone. Because you get down there, and you're like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, I'm, it's not stop. It's not stopping, it's not stopping, it's not stopping. Shit, I'm going too slow. Because you right, you back to the hundred percent focus on staying alive and not seeing Elvis. You're not focused on what the motorcycle's doing, or where mm-hmm. you are on the racetrack, or how much roll speed you're carrying. You're focused on nothing. You're just trying to stay alive, right? But if you would sit up like you left pit road, use the handlebars like you're supposed to, you can see another seventy five hundred feet ahead that you couldn't see before. It's way clearer of a vision. You feel way more secure. Because your arm's out, right? you got this big, strong triangle going on. You've got all types of security. You just bomb in there, down gear, down gear, down gear. Let your outside arm go, which which transfers that weight to your inside arm, right? Push on the handlebar, and the thing just, boom, it's on its side. Right? It's, it's getting the steps so you're not overlapping too many things, right? Stop, down gear, turn, accelerate. They're not supposed to be overlapped. Stop. Stop and down gear, right? Obviously overlap. But the end of stopping is get it stopped. Whatever that takes, get it stopped. And once it's stopped, then make it turn. If you get in a little hot, don't turn in. Just keep going straight till you get it stopped. Then turn in, right? You watch a MotoGP race, you hardly ever see those guys mess up. But if you look over to the right, or the top of the screen, and you're looking at the teleticker, there are four or five tenths between laps. But you can't see it, right? But mm-hmm. he saw it. He felt he went in, and he's a little hot, so he went straight an extra two feet. But because he went straight an extra two feet, he's got to slow down a little more, because now he's got a turn shopper, right? But you don't see it, because he's only messing up two or three feet at a time, not 50 or 100 feet like the average guy does. It, it's one thing at a time. Keep it keep it simple, right? The so that's saying. a great approach, right? Figure out your exit first, in a sense, and then work out how you're entering the turn. Exits is everything, and then the, the engines doesn't matter. You trying to roll an extra two tenths through the center of the turn. So if you gain two tenths and you're going fifty miles an hour, right? Or you can give up two tenths, get the thing turned. Get it aimed straight and then go to wide open and you can hold the gas on an extra two tenths longer at the end of the straightaway. The end of the straightaway is 160 miles an hour. Which two tenths covered more ground? The 50 mile an hour zone or the 160 mile an hour zone? Right? You're going to drop six, seven, eight tenths because you had to get gas on two tenths sooner. Right? At the end of the straightaway. Give up the two tenths in the turn. The turns don't matter. It's drag strips connected by turns. It is not a road race track. Yeah. You're not trying to carry speed to the center of the turn. 
You're trying to get it stopped. You're trying to get it turned. You're trying to get it going again. We're not trying to, we're not trying to turn. That's not what it's about. Right. Meaning you're not trying to keep carry more and more and more roll speed through the center. You're trying to go in deeper, get it turned faster and get out sooner. That's a road race track. Yeah. We heard the same philosophy, uh, Fred Spencer, I think that was his philosophy as well. 100%, right? He talks about cold tires and hot tires and how he would change what he was doing. And he'd kill it, annihilate the guys in the first couple of laps, right? Because he's driving it up on the tire. He'd get it stopped, right? Yeah. Which built heat and is the exact same spot every time. Then he'd get it turned, which didn't take that much energy. So <clears throat> if you change this up a little, you have a hundred percent of everything, right? Nobody rides a hundred and five percent. There is no such thing. You have a hundred percent tire. There is no hundred and five percent tire. There's no such thing, right? You have a hundred percent of a glass. If you fill it a hundred percent and go to a hundred and five percent, your hand's gonna be wet. There's no hundred and five percent. There's only a hundred, right? So if you're using a hundred percent of that front tire to stop with, you have zero percent left to turn with. So if you start turning in, then you're giving up 10% of braking for a pre-turn. If you turn in 20%, you're giving up 20% of braking, right? We want to stop and maximize the tire. We're not amateurs. 100% stop, 100% turn, 100% go again, right? And yes, there's some trail braking involved and there's some finished turn, starting to open the throttle involved. I get there's a little overlap in this, but we're talking a little overlap, not, I, I guess we're on the radio, right? So people can't see, but we're talking a little overlap, not huge overlap, right? We're not talking 20%. We're talking two, three, four, five percent right? And the other piece is rake and trail, which is a whole nother conversation matter. If the front end goes down, the trail gets short, the motorcycle will turn. So if you get down in the braking zone and you let go of the brake, the front end pops back up, it's not going to turn. Yeah. It, it takes a little tail brake. The um, trail brake really is matching load to speed. So when you get the, your braking's basically done and you're starting to turn in, that's when you're easing off the brake lever. That's trail braking. But you're doing it to keep the front end down and keep it still because if it pops back up, it's not going to turn. And the same thing in the just past apex if you turn and turn and turn and and you get impatient and you crack the throttle open as soon as you crack the throttle open the front end's coming up and when the front end comes up the trail gets longer and the motorcycle is going to start heading to the grass or fight you for the last little piece of the turn right it's one thing at a time get it stopped get it turned get it going nice well this is the best mathematical demonstration of do you want to gain two tenths at 35 miles an hour in the turn or 160 miles an hour on the straight. It's a no-brainer. That's just right? math. Right. Yep. And the other thing is, we did a course with uh, Aaron Stevenson over here in um, North Carolina. He has a, this cool dirt bike school. We train on XR100s, but it's a road race track in dirt. So he also goes and has track days at VIR in um, CMP, Colorado Motorsports Park. So I did this one school. It was 100% money back guarantee. And this school was called, the school was called Fat, Lazy, and Stupid. <laughs> and I taught 15 people showed up. This is the first time we did it. We only advertised for like a week. And um, 15 people signed up. When I was done, every single one of them came over to my trailer at the end of the day and thanked me. Two of them were were uh, instructors that normally teach the school, took the class, because it was at the end of the day, took the class, and both of them gave me 100 bucks. And to them, it, the class was free. They gave me money, and they were instructors. And every single person, all 15 of them, at the end, we were in a group. We were all kind of laughing together, having fun together. And when I said to the first guy, all I want to know is, what was the biggest gain you had today? Not speed. The biggest gain you had today. 
And he's like, well, oh, that's a no brainer. I'm like, well, what was it? So yesterday at the end of the day, I sat in a recliner chair in his lawn chair and I had this migraine headache and I had to sit there for an hour and I, and I knew I was de- probably dehydrated and I'm drinking, drinking, drinking. I was exhausted. I was even thinking about going home, thinking about riding today, just in doing your class was going to completely wipe me out. He said, but I got the headache to go away. I stayed. We did the class this morning. We were, it was a riot. We had a blast. It was a riot. And, um, he said, at the end of the day, I heard on the PA system, we needed here with the help with the air fence. And I drove my scooter out and helped him load air fence. And then I loaded my motorcycle and realized you were still here. And I came over to talk to you. And I said, so what you're saying is it was half the amount of energy. He says, no, what I'm saying is yesterday I was exhausted. I had a migraine headache. I was so bad. I could hardly even walk. And today I rode twice as much as I rode yesterday. And it's the second day. And I don't even feel like I rode today. It was so much easier. I dropped a second and a half, but that wasn't the biggest piece. The biggest piece was it was a tenth of the amount of effort I was putting in before. He says, and it goes just like you said. He says, that, and it's, he said, and I kept on saying to those guys, I try and do sentences that you'll do in your head, up over down, up over down, all I'm allowed to do, up over down, push on the bar, up over down, push on the bar, up over down, push on the bar, up over down, push on the bar. That's all you're allowed to do. Just keep on saying it, up over down, right? Ass up, ass over, ass down, push on the inside bar. Up, over, down, push on the bar. He says, within three practice sessions, I'm just doing it, and I'm actually putting in laps, and I can see my lap timer going down. You know, I get to the end of practice, and I realized I hadn't broke a sweat yet. (laughs) He says, and I said to myself, geez, I wonder if it was up, over, and down, just talking to himself. And when he said it to himself, he says, I started laughing that it was 100% up over down that did it that's exactly what i was doing i didn't do anything else i never tucked in i never did anything i just sat there up over down and he was on a yamaha r6 right in vir i mean the front straight at vir is 140 miles an hour and he just rode the whole thing sitting up right then every single lap he just went faster and faster and faster never mind it's way cooler right because you get all that air the whole time right right we're not trying to be cool. We're trying to learn something, right? The other way to learn is to get rid of stuff. Right? Keep it simple. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. It's also like self-affirmations, I think. I mean, it, you told him what to tell himself, himself, and he started believing it and doing it. You took the thinking out of it. He was just... Well, no, nobody will be... Like, if, if I said, hey, we're going to go walk on water... We're probably pretty assured that's not going to happen, right? But, no. but somehow this dude win races. I watched him in the day. I mean, he was one of the top guys in the country. That I kind of need to listen to him. If he says we're going to walk on water, we're going to walk on water, right? But you're never going to quite get that in their head because they know we're not going to walk on water, right? That's just impossible. But when you do it on the motorcycle side, even though I'm saying it's against what they know what they have read and what they learn from other people they are willing to say well that dude was fast in his day and i he went by me in practice on his little ninja 400 at like friggin' warp speed i couldn't even think about keeping up with him and i'm on my r6 that he obviously knows what he's doing and he's doing it too right he's up he's not all tucked in yeah even on the little 400 right i'm six two so, anyways, what's the differences between those the the little Ninja four hundreds, the six hundreds, the leader bike, and and the bikes used to race in the eighties that are in that the were old super days? Handy. You'd be uh, LGBTQ if you didn't ride a big bike. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's just the way it was, right? It, it's I mean, uh, LGBTQ plus. When I when I started, don't forget when I started, it was eighty two, right? So. The seventies were basically still alive. Um, I can tell you stories that were blue in the face between drinking and partying and the guys at the racetrack and stuff that was going on that 
if you weren't on a big bike, you would just, I mean, you were laughed out of the pit area, right? <laughs> and, but today, the little bikes are so freaking cool and they're so fast, like a Ninja 400. You have to do something wrong to get it to crash. You cannot get it to the ground, right? It'll fight you till it's blue in the face to not let you crash it, right? Um, so because of that, you can carry so much roll speed and the speed is down enough that you can comprehend what you're doing, right? You go buy a freaking Pan- Panigale, I mean, it's 220 horse. I couldn't ride that thing to save my life at this point in my life, right? It just It's just way too fast for how much information I can process, you know, at the moment. And if you're an amateur, it's 100% that mode. You're buying that bike because you have a deficiency someplace and you're trying to make up for it, right? You didn't buy that bike because you had to have it. Like, you had to have it to go have a decent track day. If you don't have a decent track day, you need to be able to, you know, Ninja 400. And, which is funny, my motorcycle team owner, Bob Robbins, at the end of the, when we stopped the motorcycle team, we sold all the bikes. He didn't want one. He wouldn't ride it. Then I had so many spares that me and the mechanic sat, and we built two out of spares. And I gave him one, and I kept one. And I bring him to the racetrack, and we go and ride together. And I left after the first session. He rode all day. At the end of the day, he calls me up and says, I hate to say this, but I rode every single lap of every single session. In the last half of the day, I rode double sessions. I rode the amateur group and the expert group, because he's on a small bike that I'm in the amateur group. I rode the amateur group and the big group. And I'm sore as hell because I can't believe how many miles I rode today. I dropped two and a half seconds faster than I've gone in the last five years today on the 400. I'm like, what do you mean two and a half seconds? He says, my best last time on my 900 Ducati air cooled something, something, something. I don't know what that thing is, was this. And I was two and a half seconds faster on the 400. The 400 makes 46 horse. His other bike makes 100. Yeah. He's two and a half seconds faster on it because he could sit up. He learned how to use the handlebars again, right? It's mellow enough and numb enough that when he went for full throttle, it didn't just fire itself off the racetrack. It took a second before it went off the racetrack. Well, that second was long enough to get him to realize I'm getting on the gas too soon, right? And he was able to adjust all day. And by the end of the day, he was hauling the mail. He was about ready to retire. That was five years ago. Then he's still riding just because of the Ninja 400. Since then, he, every one of his buddies has one. So they've got like 15 of them now of all his buddies ride. So they all go ride together. Um, and every single one of them is sped up seconds because of the 400. They get back on their big bike and they're way faster. Right? And you're back to the beginning. Mm-hmm. You have to crash it. It won't crash itself. And it's just fast enough to give you the excitement that you're looking for and just slow enough to give you time to comprehend it. Right. I even have one. My, my, don't tell anybody though, but mine's cheated up. Um, <laughs> mine's sitting right behind nobody, me. Nobody listens to us. No worries. Yeah. Mine makes 65 horse. Um, and it's a friggin', I almost killed myself. I had a uh, Jackson Blackman ride Bob's bike and I was on mine and we went out and I let him lead for a couple of laps. And then I passed him in the two hottest sections on the outside at VIR just to prove a point to him. Cause he was telling me he, he couldn't do something. And I was trying to explain it's cause he won't listen to me. So I passed him on the outside in the two hottest sections. And when we came back in, he's like, what happened? Like, what are you talking about? He's like that time you almost crashed. I'm like, oh, yeah, man. It was a left-right combination. And it was the first time I was on, I had just built it. And I went left and I floored it to make the right, which I had been doing on the stock ones. And when I floored it, the freaking thing wheelied. But I was trying to make a left-right combo. But when it wheelied, I couldn't make the right. I had to get the front wheel back on the ground. The thing's wallowing and wiggling. I had all I could do to keep it on the racetrack. When Billy made the turn, 
I look back at him like, holy shit, I almost died. <laughs> I definitely saw Elvis that day. Um, so it's, it's, you know, a cool ride anyways. Uh, are you a bigger star on motorcycles or cars? I have, I made it farther on the bikes than I did in the cars. I, I, I really needed to stop the cars a few years sooner and I could have made it over there, but I stopped just too late and I couldn't quite get to the next step, not where I needed to be. So, um, what's happening at the moment though, is, um, I'm actually signed through 2025 at the moment. So I'm signed till I'm 65 years old. And, um, when you talk to those guys, when other guys ask, I don't understand why you keep putting him in the car or why something and their comeback is the same every single time. Have you seen him drive? You're like, yeah. They're like, what happens? Like, what do you mean? They're like, if you watch the race, what happens? It was like, he's usually like fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth at the beginning of the race. And at the end of the race, cautions will start coming out and he starts making these unbelievable moves. It ends up third, fourth, fifth. He's like, yeah, that's why he's in the car. He knows how to save the car and get it to the end. And he knows that he needs something left. The race was at the end because that's when the money's paid. It's not paid at the beginning of the day. It's paid at the end of the day. And he can still get the job done that he was so far ahead riding the motorcycles that when he backed down to the cars, even though he's only 70% what he used to be, he's still above most people, right? Because my initial hit was up here, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, and, and I'm not saying it as an ego statement, but it might come back to people is when they want to know when I'm going to quit, especially my son. My comeback is when I don't make that move, like someone crashes in front of me and I don't see it coming and I just poof, right into them. When I get in that mode, then that's when I'll quit. Right. I still probably won't, but that's when I say I'll quit. I ah. made this killer move at Daytona this year, going into turn one, 180 miles an hour. Someone spun somebody else out right in front of me. And I missed hitting the center of the door by two inches. And I went right up around him and I missed the front of that car by two inches. And then I missed the guy outside of me by two inches, all at 180 miles an hour. Right. Well, cars, we were three by three at the time. So it was complete chaos and I didn't touch a soul. I, so I, I have a, I have a complicated question now. The difference be, in the money between cars and motorcycles, why do you think there's so much of a difference and how can motorcycles uh, get to the same level of money that the cars are? The problem is, um, the problem is actually simple. If you follow the road race series, those guys struggle to get money too. And the issue is when you go to Elkhart Lake, it's 4.2 miles, right? So even a fast car is two minute 20. So every two minute 20, you get to see him for 20 seconds. And two minute 20 later, you get to see him for 20 seconds. And two minute 20 later, you get to see him for 20 seconds. It's just not exciting enough to go to the races and watch. Unless you're watching it on TV. Then when you watch it on TV, the speed is down so much because the camera robs the speed. It looks like they're friggin' parked, right? Especially if they're single file. So the race isn't that exciting. But when you go to a NASCAR race, and not that, trust me, it's not that I like NASCAR. You go to a NASCAR race, I mean, they're in a circle. So you can sit anywhere in the stands and watch them 360 degrees around the racetrack. And because you're right there, they're going by, you know, I mean, you you get that sensation of speed, even if you're 40 aisles up, right? You still get the sensation of speed. So, and you get it when you're watching TV, that it just... It's just, it's just the way it is. It's not going to happen. The other problem is when, um, when I ran camel was around, right? Camel cigarettes was around in their advertising budget was in the B's right in the billions, not millions in the B's, the billions was their advertising budget. So that's why we had the camel challenge and camel dash for cash and camel this and camel that and camel cigarettes and camel coat camel pit road and i mean camel girls and you name it right they couldn't spend money fast enough 
their budget was in the B's, right? It was in the billions. So they were throwing money at every single series out there, right? There's a Camo AMA Camo Pro series. So now all the series can't get funding and it has to run by what they get on the gate, right? What the competitors pay to race. And it's just, there's not enough money out there to give it back to the, to the riders, right? Never mind what it costs the racetracks to operate today, right? You used to be able to rent the racetrack for 500 bucks. Now it's $30,000 a day to go rent like Sonoma. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people talk about that, that age of, of cigarette advertising. Uh, I, know, I know Miguel was talking about it a lot. I, I think the economy <clears throat> today, the software companies are bigger than what the cigarette companies used to be. And, and I think we need to tap those those but they don't you, you're talking about market shares and values and and hits right so you go watch the best Mount america race ever right which is probably the bagger race by the way go watch the best motor race ever and then go monday and look at the at the ratings and it was seen by three hundred fourteen thousand people right they're not even willing to look at that number, right? Yeah, that's, to them, but, that's on the side of point something. 314,000 is on the, that side of the number. Point something. It's not even worth looking at. Yeah, but that's but, that's how it works now with TV. I mean, how many people watch The Tonight Show? I mean, you don't see Johnny Carson getting, you know, 50 million anymore. I mean, they're lucky yeah, to have half but, a million. That's the problem, right? And the other issue is... And, you know, people went to Loudoun and it was bike week. They went to Daytona. It was bike week. They went to Laguna. It was bike week. They took their vacation to go to Daytona for bike week, right? The Loudoun used to have four or 500,000 people there. I took my kids a few years ago. It was probably 10 years ago now. There was 3,000 people there. Like, it's not even bike week, right? It's a couple of guys dressing up like Holly dudes and let their beards grow for two days. Didn't shave for two days, right? Um, you go to Daytona. I went to Daytona, shit, 2015 or something. There was probably 40 people in the stands, right? I mean, when I went to Mid-Ohio, Mid-Ohio was the smallest race racetrack we ran. There's 55,000 people there. Wait, that was the smallest we had. Yeah. Daytona would be 100,000 plus people. I got a picture in front of me. You look in the grandstands behind us and they're friggin' packed in turn one, right? It's just it's just a different era, right? They're, with your cell phone, my, my younger son does it. He refuses to commit to something until that moment because something else might pop up that's better. He didn't plan mounts out to go to Daytona. He waits to the day he's going to get in the truck and then decides... Yeah, nothing else came up. I guess I'll go. Right, that's the other problem, or at least the way I see it. Yeah, grabbing grabbing the intention of uh, Gen Zers is a little, little little bit more difficult. Yes, hundred percent. But but those guys are more into experiences and less into uh, sitting at home watching TV. So I, I think I think if we make the races more exciting for them, uh, we build better racetracks and have better viewing positions. We, we make it an experience, just like Supercross or, or NASCAR. I think, so, I think that's a good way of attracting the young the generation. First year I came, the first year I came back and I was talking to Wayne Rainey and, and Sip Asplin and those guys, we, um, I was complaining about the numbers. It, you can't, especially with my eyesight, right? I can't look out on the racetrack and see a motorcycle and tell you in a millisecond who that is. And sometimes even after they go by, I can't decide which rider I'm looking at. Right. Um, like the attack, right. I, I know they have two riders, but I don't know which one I'm looking at because they have the identical suits, right. Oh, one's white and blue and one's blue and white, but I still don't know who's wearing the suit to know the difference between them. I just know it's the blue and white guy. No, it's white and blue. No, it's the blue and white. No, then you're arguing over that, right? 
And then I'm trying to explain to my girlfriend, hey, watch this motorcycle. Which one? The white and blue one. Well, there's eight white and blue ones. No, the guy with the blue and white leathers on the white and blue motorcycle. What? Right? I should be able to say, hey, watch the 32. But you can't read the number. Well, they were unwilling to make the number bigger because of aerodynamics. I'm like, well, then make the side number bigger, at least. Let's put a little number plate on the back like we used to on the rear seat on that section and do it. No, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. I'm like, okay, well, good luck getting your girlfriend interested in what's going on. There's no possible way she can follow it. I can't even explain it. How is she going to follow it? Right. right? The guy's wife and all that, that, that when you go, you're into it, they're not. What's your odds of coming back? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You need yeah. your wife to go, your girlfriend to go, or you can't go. Right. Yep. So to me, certain things need to be addressed that nobody wants to do anything about. And that's why the baggers get getting so big because they're so different between one another. You kind of know who you're, who you're following. Yeah. It also sounds like, I mean, in racing, characters are always bigger than life. Even in MotoGP, the new generation seems sanitized compared to the uh, Rossi Lorenzo, you know, all these battles and these characters. And now, in Moto America, like him or not, Josh Heron has a bit of a character and he does some social media and he's right. a little, you, you have to be a little controversial. You have to be bigger than life. Right. And if you're this bland, corporate, super polished guy, you're not going to get anybody excited watching you. 100%. Right. And again, that's why I'm signed through next year because I'm the, I'm still the action pack guy. If something's going on, it's around me every single weekend. I'm involved somehow, whether I caused it or not. <laughs> so, um, anyways, they, there's in, in, you also need rivalries, right? Guys feuding with one another. There's things going on, or, right? You get all that stuff going on, which is always a plus. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you got you got speaking speaking of a, of a bad viewing experience live. You got the the Vegas F one that they spent I don't know how many millions just just to make that racetrack. Right. Uh, and it was it was a horrible 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 circuit to race on. And then they had the and, tire problem, right? Yeah, you know, eight guys raced. It, you, you had you had uh, uh, sore sore. Um, Sewer cap popping off, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and people paid two thousand dollars a ticket just you know to sit there and say, "Hey, I went to F one in Vegas." Uh, so I, I don't know. Maybe maybe we can piggyback off of that. Uh, off, off we of don't get to make that decision, right? Yeah. Um, and that's a case of like you go to a racetrack and you're in there mowing when we get there, right? Like, you didn't realize the grass was going to be tall from the other 364 days of the year that it should have got mowed two days ago, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but the left hand isn't talking to the right hand, and the right hand has no idea what's going on. I get tired how many races I go to because I'm the lower division in NASCAR that when I tell them I'm running the ACA series, that they, they look at me like I've got three heads. They don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm like, well, we're the race, we're the guys that race on Friday. Well, we don't have a race on Friday. They didn't even know they were racing on Friday. Never mind what our series is called. Yeah. So you, you got that going on, and that's what happened with the manhole covers. You get guys working on the racetrack, guys designing it, and guys up in the booth trying to oversee everything. Well, they're not thinking of what each other's are doing. And what the manhole cover really was was the ground effects under the car is vacuum right? Sucking the car to the racetrack. Well, instead it pulled the manhole up because that was easier. It pulled the manhole up out of the hole, yeah. but nobody thought about it. Right. And the guy that put the manhole down it, he doesn't know. He's this, he's the sewage guy, right? He's the drain pipe guy. They told him to put a drain pipe here. And it needs to be six inches out of the ground. And he put it there. And then the paver came along and said, but oh, don't forget, there's a manhole over there. We got to pave around it. Then they paved around it. Right? It's got nothing to do with them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But but the fan paid the price, which is your point, right? They paid two thousand dollars to go see a race that they couldn't even 
drive because they couldn't figure out how to hold the manholes down. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, and they were, they were happy to do it. And I'm sure they're going to do it next year too. Uh, I guess the real question is how do we transfer it to Motor America and, and to two wheels, which is where our interest lies. Yeah, yeah. I know. I mean, they, we've been getting more and more prestige that the fact that the world, some of the world superbike guys came over and those guys are coming over, even though they are in the bagger class. Um, they still came over, right? That we've been getting some huge press on the what what Motor America is able to do lately is talk about a global footprint because the European guys have come over. Now you've got Australia, New Zealand, England, all those guys covering MotoGP. The MotoGP, uh, sorry, Motor America, is also covered in like 17 different countries at the moment. All because of that, right? Because every time some new rider comes in, somebody else wants to pick up on it, right? And then... Because of the bagger class, they just sold rights to that to run in England that they're going to have a series over there using our right. rule package. Yeah. Right? So so that's going to bring even more press to them. The, those are the pieces they need to keep building on. Yeah, I think they did it before with the Harley-Davidson XR1200. Yes. Yeah. Right. Which was, I think, a... a bigger hit in Europe than it was here. Yes. 100%. Yes. It, I forget what that thing was called now that you're bringing it up. But yes, that class over there was huge. Right? Because yeah. everyone wants to be an American. Yeah. Right? There's nothing better than leaking oil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what Formula had done, uh, one's done really well also is this uh, series they put on Netflix that got a lot of people who knew nothing about it to be very interested. And I watched the MotoGP equivalent and it was kind of a yawn. And I, you know, they've created this whole drama around the teams and, and the, I mean, the team managers who you never see racing, but you see them on TV are a big part of the drama and, you know, Toto and, and the, you know, 100%. Red Bull guy right. and we, right. we have to create this because people like drama. That's how all TV shows work. If there's no drama, nobody watches. And, you know, they're actually making it more and more civilized which okay is nice because of corporate sponsors, but that's not what gets the eyeballs. Right. And, and, and you know, the best thing, one of the best things Motor America does is when they do the pit road walk and they walk through the pits and they talk to people, right? They waste that hour doing that is really cool. Cause you get to see a ton of behind the scenes thing and see what's going on. The other thing I think they do that cool is between races when Roger Hayden is commenting on what's going on that day and, this guy's struggling with his bike or he got hurt last week and he's trying to rehab his ankle and they've gone through this process and it gives you some idea of what's going on. So when the race starts, you kind of have some idea to who to root for. Or if the guy's not going as good as you think he should, when you factor in his ankle and he's finished third, you're like, well, yeah, the guy had a good day. You took a boring race and turned it into something exciting because you know the backstory, right? You know how the guy got there, right? So, Yep. So I agree that it's it's all the little pieces. The problem is just what you're asking me, and I don't have an answer. How do you get it in front of people, and how do you get people in front of it, right? How do you get the two to come together? Yeah. Yeah. We were talking to uh, Leisner uh, last podcast, and he believes electric uh, scooters and bicycles and bikes are going to get more use eventually. Yeah, you want to burn cycling. the garage to the ground? <laughs> Um, but I mean, I, I see, no... I see a lot of kids on those compared to gas motorcycles. Yeah, yeah. Which... Don't get me going on the electric thing. Um... <laughs> we we do need a gateway drug, I think. <laughs> it um, yeah. I didn't want to get going on the electric thing. I'm in like nine nine million percent against the electric thing. Um, just just for starters. There's not even nearly enough cobalt to even have this conversation, right? Never mind trying to charge it. That 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 yeah. There's there's this one cool video, and it's a uh, it's a gentleman in Canada, and they came in and they were going to fine him for not moving toward electric trucks. He owns a trucking company, so he 
turns around and he opens a file and he pulls the file, opens the file cabinet, he pulls out a file and he says, you see this? This is the letter I submitted to the electric company telling them what I was thinking of doing. You see this? This is the one I sent to the DOT, Department of Transportation, show them what I was thinking of doing. You see this? This is the one that shows them what my five-year plan was. He says, can you see this? This was the first response. The first response is the electric company saying, there's no possible way we can feed you that amount of electricity. That's more than a third of the whole city uses. Yeah. He says, so where was I going to go from there? I can't make electricity, right? You just, there's no way to power that situation, right? Again, don't get me going on it. But after you watch a couple of the videos, right? Never mind trying to put one out. They show in Europe, they have 40 foot containers full of liquid, right? They pick the car up and submerge it in the liquid until it stops doing whatever it's doing. Mm -hmm. But my question is, where do those 3,000 gallons or 5,000 gallons of liquid, where does it go? After you've put out 40 electric car fires, where's the liquid go, yeah. right? You get all the contaminant building the batteries and you get all this dead fluid Right. Never mind the smoke and that. And it's just it makes no sense. There's uh, none of it that makes sense. I, I think the questions that you're asking are questions that uh, both the Canadian and the U.S. government are not smart enough to ask because they just it, have no clue. They don't. But don't get me going on that either. They don't care about asking. Someone's padding their pockets and they put money in the bank. They don't care what the next thing is. Right. It's not. Yeah. There's no reality going on in the United States period right yeah. again don't get me going on it it's not yeah. gonna help Sa let's same, move on same here what yeah. keeps you That's motivated fine. you've raced for 40 years now 45 um i've never had a job that's what keeps me motivated <laughs> i get to go work on race stuff every single day right i'm even here on sundays um it's just i still enjoy building something and then go and bring it to the racetrack and beating somebody with it, knowing that I did it, right, that I built it. And driving, I enjoy helping the kids that struggle to drive. I mean, we won, I won the junior cup the last three years in a row. The first year I helped Tyler Scott win it as a rider coach. And last year I helped uh, Travis Wyman. I built the engines, but two years ago, and last year with Avery Dreher, that's my motorcycles, my suspension, my everything, my rear sets. I built the engines, right? And I help them ride it. So I watch it live on Motor America Live Plus at the shop in North Carolina. And then when they get done practice and they call me up and I tell them what he's doing wrong and we do something about it and we go win the races the next day. Are you going to keep doing, doing uh, racing yourself, Arma and in those series and i think you did uh so, you did uh two years australia ago i had spinal stenosis which is my back closing up on my nerves and i was getting it in a day i couldn't even stand up so i had it fixed and that really woke me up and then this past winter i had two complete knees put in and i it's funny i stopped um i forget the exact date but i basically ran bobber on like the second week in October. And then on Wednesday, on Thursday, I had my first knee put in. And then maybe it was September. And then in November, I had my second knee put in. Well, and then I had to go test at Daytona. But the test in Daytona was eight weeks in. But in six weeks, the doctor would sign me off to drive again. So I had to go six weeks, apply for my NASCAR license, get it all done in a week, which everybody was mad at me. But then I couldn't sign up for the test because I didn't have my license yet, but I couldn't get my license until I got signed off. And I didn't want to bring it up because I didn't want anybody talking about it just in case they said, no, it's too early to go test. So I had to pay a late fee, $400 penalty late fee to go test at Daytona. <laughs> right. So I, I've been rebuilding myself over the last couple of years. So a, I can keep, driving and riding but be more importantly 
I was getting so I was, I could only function four or five hours a day. And the rest of the day, I was sitting in a chair or doing nothing. So I'm trying to work my way back to working full time, which according to my son, I'm still only at like 30%. But don't tell anybody. <laughs> no one's going to listen. No one's going to yeah. hear this. You rode some pretty good, well, good exotic motorcycles in, in, in your day. A slew of Ducatis and Bemotas and uh, a bunch of other exotics. Um, I have a list over here of, of all the Bemotas you were on. Oh, uh, let's see here. You were you were in, on actually Ducati NCR eight fifty, uh, Bemota YB four. Well, it's not really a YB four, but it, it had a YB four uh, chassis, uh, DB one. Uh, Tezzy 1D. Um, yeah, the Tezzy. That's a swing arm front end motorcycle. Which one was your favorite? And, and how does the Tezzy compare to um, an actual um, standard front end? So the problem with that design, in everybody's design, even Elf when they did it, is it takes the front end feel away. You don't really know what the tire's doing that it won't transition that energy back. So you're riding, you're riding, you're riding, the next thing you know, you're face planted, or you're 10 feet in the air. That's why all the DET European guys, every one of them got hurt, and they got hurt bad, because uh, when it did that little wheel hop, when it landed, everything was so stiff, it was multiplied times 100. So the next thing that happened was just catastrophic, right? So, um, but up until that point, that thing was awesome to ride. I mean, it was, was just, it was just, it did everything you asked it to do. You just didn't know what it was doing, but it did what you asked it to do. Right. And, um, that's actually a funny story that they called me up and asked me if I would campaign it, they would pay for it. So we struck a deal. They send it over. The first thing I do is dyno it. And it's a turd. And they explicitly said, you can't work on the engine. We're going to build the engine. We're going to get the engine done. Somebody over here, you just need to do the rest. So I dyno it. It's a turd. So I instantly take the engine out, bring it to Farachi. Farachi fixes it. We put it back in. I go to Daytona. They're supposed to show up on Wednesday. On Thursday, they're still not there. Friday, I get a phone call in the morning. Hey, I'm coming. I'll be there around noon. I'm like, okay. New time it comes, the guy comes walking up, and I'm like, hey, what happened? You were supposed to be here on Wednesday. And the guy says, because he's full-on Italian, right? And he says, oh, I uh, I uh, get off plane and go out to uh, taxi and say uh, I need to um, go to uh, Dayton Beach. He says, then the guy looks over the back of the seat at me like I'm a weirdo and says, what do you mean Daytona Beach? He says, yeah, I, uh, Motel Daytona Beach, uh, A A one A Daytona Beach. And the guy says, you do realize that's 18 hours from here, right? And the guy's like, what are you talking about? And they go back and forth. He's in Dayton, Ohio. Because <laughs> he told the <laughs> travel agent, I need a ticket to Daytona. And that's where they sent him, Daytona. <laughs> Ohio. So he had to wait to get a plane out of Ohio down to Daytona Beach, which, as you can imagine, there isn't one. Yeah. Right? You had to get oh, three boy. planes to get there. It was kind of a good, fun, stupid story. Um, so the DB1 was the same thing. We got that thing. It was a turret. Farachi built that, too. That's what I won my first pro race on at Sonoma. My first pro winner's circle was at Sonoma, too was third and super bike. So that was kind of cool. Um, and I built all the rear sets and had Cosman big, huge brakes on the front Changed We changed everything on that thing, um, to get it to win. That thing was a blast to drive. Um, it was like a monkey having a football trying to ride it though. Cause I was six, two and it was like two, six. So it's like, I couldn't even fit behind the windscreen. I had a special windscreens made 
they were like two inches forward, so I get my head down. Um, the Bermuda Dici was uh, the YB4, I guess. Um, yeah, the Dici was human racing's endurance bike. Yes. And 91. it had a 180 horse Yamaha motor in it. Yeah. And that thing was just a rocket ship. I mean, nobody could run with us when that thing would run right and finish. We just went and annihilate the field. Um, that thing was a blast to drive. I actually, at mid Ohio one year, the race started and it was raining. And I had to do two laps in the pouring rain on slicks because we didn't have rain tires mounted. And I come in, we put rain tires on, and I went back out. And I lapped the field twice to get back on the lead lap, and we finished third. But I lapped the field twice on the thing. My buddy tells this story about it was this one left-right combo, and I went by him and put to do it the way I was doing it. I was wheeling him through that whole section. He says, well, you went by me, and I watched the tire go by my shield because you were wheeling, in, like, right by my shield. And it freaked me out to the end. And then I realized it was you, which didn't freak me out any less. But at least I knew how to come and yell at. He says it was just the freakiest thing to watch this tire go by your shield, right? I said, the only reason I did it was because it was you, right? Um, they were all good bikes, right? I, I drove a Harley XR1200 for a little while for um, Eagle Racing way back in the uh, shit, 86, I guess. That thing went pretty good. Um, I had the, my Kawasaki Ninja was the best, my original one, 84. 86 Suzuki was good. It was, it had killer front end that you really knew what it was doing. That bike was good. I I only finished a couple races on that thing. We finished like second and third. Um, the ZX that I won Mid Ohio on was, that thing was probably the best all around bike. Um, after I rode that, I rode the Ducati for the Ducati 916, going out to 953, I guess. Um, I didn't like it as much as I liked the Kawasaki. It didn't, it didn't really like my size. It didn't like all that weight on the front end. Um, that's a funny story too. I was for Archie's, I won for Archie's first road races on, uh, uh, Ducati F2, F1, F2, I forget what they called them. Um, I rode that a couple of races for a, uh, gentleman Johnson owned it. And then, um, Farachi got the Ducati deal and we won the championship for the first year with Farachi was with me. And we had the two bikes the following year. We had the twins bike and the super bike, which was Commonwealth Honda, Randy Renfro on the twins bike. So we were the show. I mean, we were never more than three inches apart for the entire race. Every single racetrack we went to, that was the show. And um, the that year, Daytona 89, I guess, I won the twins class. I won the endurance race. And I was leading the superbike race, and the thing quit. So I would have won all three. And that bike only finished a couple races all season. And the ones that finished, we finished like second and third in. So it was up front every time it ran. Um, but then the following year, Jamie James ended up getting the ride because he had the number one plate. They gave it to him, which was probably a plus because they stuck him on Yokohama tires and he crashed 957,000 times, which saved me some bone abuse. So yeah, anyway. You may... You made Gal happy because since he got a Bimota, the question is always, what's your favorite bike to ride and why is it the Bimota? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, that thing was just, it, it was kind of my favorite because of just how fast it was. It, it, it was just, it, it was just, it was just cool. I didn't even know what words to use. It was just cool. Well, actually, my so. my, my second favorite to ride is the Bimota. The, the first one is, is still Carrie's monster that he built for me. Which is an actual it, Ducati monster? No, he he he, he built me a GSXR one thousand. Oh yeah, yeah, that kind of monster. That's yeah. why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, like Big Papa. You got a little Big Papa. I yeah, I think mine is faster than Big Papa. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah, he definitely builds. He built my vintage bike. I had him build my vintage bike. So he built some good stuff. So what's the what's the serious point story that he that he told me that you're gonna? Oh, I can't tell it. Yeah, you can. Carrie Andrews' nickname was Scary Carrie, <laughs> and he'd stuff you, but then he couldn't make the turn, and it pissed me off to no extent. And my father had sent me out the the West Coast in '83 because um, I had run one one or two pro races the year before. I think we finished fifth at Mid Ohio, my first pro race. To kind of figure out how to be a better pro, so when the season started, we'd be more on top of it. So I lived in my box van for a month, and I hung out with Mega Cycle and Jim Dewar and all those guys. And but I'd go to Sonoma and I'd race Kerry Andrews and um, Jim Lindeman, the suspension guy, would come out, and um, Rich Oliver would be out there, right? To race those guys. Um, so, anyways, we're running one of the club races, and he probably stuffed me seven times, and nine times he didn't make the turn. And I finally just got sick of it. And we come down the front straightaway, and I stuff him going into turn 11, which is a stop, 180-degree right, right? But I just kept going straight, and I 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 kept going straight till just before I hit the hay bales, and I turned. And I never looked back. I just kept going. And I come by the next lap. He wasn't in the hay bales, which I couldn't believe he made the turn. Mm -hmm. So we never talked about it afterwards right but he knew i was just done i was done right so a few years ago i rode for him at phillips island and we're hanging out in the car and he sent the motorcycles back here and i fixed the geometry on him which and we haven't got to ride him since which is a shame but anyways i started really hanging out with him and he came to a couple car races well they got brought up and i told his wife the story and he's like he got wicked upset he's like i didn't know that and i'm like yeah well what do you think i went straight for he said well i just thought you were trying to piss me off not hurt me i said well i wasn't trying to hurt you i was just trying to i was trying to stick you in the fucking hay bale though but i wasn't really trying to hurt you i was trying to make a point that this isn't happening anymore like completely put the kibosh to it he said, yeah, but you were trying to hurt me. Like, I couldn't get him off. I'm trying to hurt you. I'm like, I wasn't trying to hurt you. I was just trying to fix the situation, right, <laughs> to the nth degree. Um, that leads me to a Miguel Miguel story, same basic thing. Miguel and I have had a couple of altercations, and I probably caused most of it. But he's the factory guy. I'm the support guy. And I'm um, going down the back straightaway. He's on the factory Suzuki. And I'm... Um, out riding them in the infield section, I'd just barely get by him. Then it powered me down the straightaway. And then I'd have to get by him again. And he beat me, but he kept beating me to the start finish line. So on the last lap, I'm ahead of him and I'm hacking him off going down the straightaway. And I'm actually elbowing him and he's trying to push back and I'm elbowing him. And finally I reached over and punched him and we race and I beat him to the line, right? So fast forward five years. Now he's on the factory Kawasaki and, um, uh, and I'm having my best year ever. And I'm Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Life is great. And I think we're at Road Atlanta. And I don't even remember what the situation was, but it was the same basic thing. We were duking it out in the heat race going down the straightaway, basically. But he went over and complained to the um, race director. So the race director comes over and he's talking to me. He's, of course, he's not really talking to me, right? He's telling me stuff. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. So as soon as he walked away, I walked over to Miguel and said to Miguel, listen to me. If you ever go talk to the race director again, it'll be the last lap you ever do. If I don't wipe you out on the racetrack, I'll wipe you out by before we leave pit road. It'll be the last fucking lap you ever do. If a race director ever comes over and talks to me, Ed, if you can't handle the situation on your own, quit. Right? So he said something. He basically mouthed off as he walked away. So the next day we started the race and I stuffed him going into turn five and on my way by, I ripped off his quick clutch lever. <laughs> right. Just to, again, to prove a point, like, don't tell me what you're doing. I'll tell you what we're doing. Do you, you think you, so, have, you think you have a little anger issue or no, it's just, it's just normal. 
I'm 6'2", 190 pounds, and I was solid friggin' rock. None of those guys were messing with me. Nobody messed with me. Nobody, right? <laughs> and I raced fair. If I stuffed you, I stuffed you. But I didn't make you stand it up, and I didn't loot, not do my line, right? If I stuffed you, I stayed on the inside. I left you on the outside, right? It was fair. I might have stuffed you, but I didn't take your line away. I didn't do something stupid. Right. I wasn't that kind of thing, but I'm going to say it again. I stopped you. Right. <laughs> but if you went to lean over and muscle me over and do something, it was like Rambo. Right. First, you, you drew first blood. It was, gloves are off. Right. From that moment on, it's I'm taking control now. Right. I get my arm up under their arm. It just muscle them out of the way because I'm turning their handlebars. Right. There's nothing they can do about it. And you just mow them over to the side of the racetrack. Right? We should arrange. I Colin Edwards. Colin Edwards at Elkhart Lake, very first lap of the endurance race. We come up to turn five, and all of a sudden he comes stuffing up underneath me, which I didn't really have a problem with. But then he mowed me across the racetrack, and he had me over in the rumble strips. And I'm looking over at him like, dude, do you know who you're screwing with? And he just, because he's, he's pre-Colin Edwards, he's trying to prove he deserves this ride. So we get down to the next turn. And I stuff it back under him. I got my arm under his arm, and I mowed him right off the racetrack. Like, he was in the grass. I just mowed him off the racetrack in, like, three feet. There's nothing he could do about it. And then went on my very way. Colin was smart enough never to come over and talk to me, though. He never brought it up. He brought it up to the team owner. Afterwards, he told the team owner the situation, Gold Hill Race, and Lee Sherritt's. And Lee says, well, that's what you get for messing with him. He says, yeah, but he said, no, I've known him a long time. There are no buts. You did something. And he told you what you were going to get away with, which was nothing. You did something, right? He's not the guy to mess with. So. That's good deterrent. So it's not an anger management issue because you don't manage it. It's just. <laughs> I, I didn't knock him down, right? That's all I can say. I didn't knock him down. I just proved I guess the point. That's managed. Yeah, I just proved the point. <laughs> well, so speaking can't... of... Uh... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to no. say, speaking of salacious controversies, what's your take on the Banyaya Marquez uh, incident last race? You know, it's funny you ask because my mentor, Jerry Wood, that taught me the road race school, Penguin School, he texts me, asked me the exact, the exact same thing. In... Okay. I text back, to me, it's obvious. And he texts back, well, I want your intake. I value your intake. And I sent back somebody else's answer because he had already typed it out. I didn't need to type it again. And the basic thing was, to me, it was a twofold situation that it's actually threefold. Once you start doing stuff like Marquez last year, because I'm going to blame the Honda because the Honda wasn't handling. He starts making stupid decisions and putting you in situations you don't want to be in. And he's on the edge and you know it and he knows it. And you miss your line because of it. You miss the apex because of it. Then you're kind of upset with him, right? You're going to make him pay for a while. You're not just going to cut him slack. So the season starts and nobody has forgot last year yet, or the year before, or the year before that, for that matter. Nobody's forgot those years yet. And he comes sliding up under the guy. And the guy was like, yeah, whatever. I know he's going to run wide. I'm just going to do this. And then Mark had bangs a Yui, like saying, screw you. It's my line, and I'm fast, and I'm going to show you guys once again. I'm God. And hooks a bangs a 180 and comes back, right? There's nothing to come back to. In, in my wording is, you know, when an airplane lands, they call it on approach, right? Mm -hmm. And he's got this angle going. He's got it going from seven miles out. And he angles himself all the way down at a slow rate until he finally touches the ground. He's on approach. Well, you're not allowed to interfere with his approach because he's already on approach, right? He's called right. into the tower. He's told everybody what he's going to do. Well, so when Marquez goes under the guy and he drifts up, he changes his approach. And once he changes it, he's not allowed to have his approach anymore. 
somebody else took it over. And Marquez said, no, I'm on approach. And he went back to it. Well, it's too late. Somebody took it over and they collided in the middle. Right. But I see it as, and I could be wrong. I see it as they're still penalizing him from last year. They knew this was going to happen. And we're not just going to give you the spot. We're not going to just let you recover and bang a 180 and come back. I'm going to fill the hole and take the hole from you. I'm not letting you recover. Unfortunately, yeah. they touched so hard, they both fell down. Right, which I'm sure the guy didn't plan on. He thought they were going to touch, not collide. So I yeah. see it as it's both their faults because you're making Marquez pay. You put yourself in that situation. And because Marquez hasn't fully adapted to being fair racing, like once you get offline, you can't come back offline. He's at, he, to me, he's at the most at fault. Right? Yeah. I, I did feel that he came back in too hard, considering there was a high chance he was going to be gotten on the cutback and just assume the guy wouldn't be there. And like, why would you? Well, and, 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 well Andy assumed even if he was there, the guy was going to let him have the spot. Yeah. Right. I'll move over from, but, the guys think of the total opposite. Screw you. I dealt with you all last year. I'm not doing it again. Yeah. Right. So I thought it was, I think it's good for the sport, first of all, because it shows to me, it really shows how hard those guys are really riding. Right. Like they both had the ability to abort and do something about it. But 40 feet ago, and they both decided, no, I'm doing this. I don't care what you do. And because of that, they collided in the middle, right? But it just shows how hard they're riding, that they couldn't do something else. Whatever they were doing needed to be done a long time ago because the bikes are so fast. Yeah. Well, good. I, I, I like it when it's Marquez's fault because it usually is. Right. Oh, you're gonna start that? You know, you know the internet is all, all over you for hating Marquez. I know, I know, but yeah, he's proven himself to be hateable. <laughs> but he's have you guys ever watched the movie Moneyball? Yes. Yeah. So Moneyball, that simplify it for people that haven't watched it, is a show on this gentleman designs a program and they take the sport and they turn it into numbers. And because now you have numbers, you can do statistics 20% of the time this is going to happen or 40% of the time this is going to happen or you got a 10% chance of making the turn, that type of thing. So when you watch a situation unfold or the guy says, well, there was an opening and I went to fill it and then the hole closed, right? When you look at that situation, you can say, he had a 20% chance of making the pass. But if he didn't make the pass on the other side, he had an 80% chance of falling down or take the same situation, right? You get a 20% chance of making the pass, but only a 20% chance on the other side of falling down. That You got a ton of time to recover. So I'm not really about falling down. I'm willing to take the chance. 2020, right? That's not that bad of a negative odd. I'll take the chance. But that situation was a 2090 situation to me. When Marquez stuffed it in under him, he only had a 20% shot at making the turn. And if he didn't make the turn, he had an 80 or 90% shot of falling down on the other side. A, between him either folding the front end, or when he came back, someone was going to fill the hole and they were going to collide. Right? So if you look at it in a percentage point from that view, Marquez has the probably 2090 on his front and the other kid has 40 60 40 percent chance he's going to make the pass and 60 percent chance they're going to collide in the middle right that they're on approach they're going to collide in the middle so if you look at it in a number sense if you can decide who you're willing to root for the other kid's not as this fault as marquez depending on how you divvy up the statistics Right. And that's the same thing racing that I try and teach the kids when 
you got to make this pass and you don't make it because you had to touch the brake lever. You're on a junior cup bike. You only make 46 horse. You touch the brake lever. They're going to pull you 10 bike lengths. It's going to take you a lap and a half to catch back up. There was only a 20% chance of making the pass and 80% chance of losing the draft. Why did you do it? Run lap two of 12, right? It's stupid, 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 and more stupid. Nothing you were thinking makes sense, right? And once you get them to stop paying attention to the numbers, all of a sudden you see their whole riding style changes. It's it's also how bad do you want it? If you don't want it that bad, get off the racetrack. But you can't, you can want it. You can over want it, which is what Marquez is at, right? He's willing to make the 1090 move. But it's dumb, right? He's just going to get hurt or worse. You're going to hurt somebody else. Yeah. Right. Is even though you've heard stories of me doing stuff to other people and doing stuff, I tried never to really put people in a situation they couldn't get out of. I got a Atlanta story. I, I met somebody across the racetrack for the lead at a wearer race. He ends up going off the racetrack at like 140. And when they come over and yelling at me about it, I'm like, hey, I didn't do it. Yes, you did. You went across 65 feet of racetrack and you pushed him off the racetrack. I'm like, no, I did not. Go watch the video. I mowed him across 65 feet of racetrack. And it took us 10 seconds to do it. So for 10 seconds, he's running out of room, running out of room, running out of room. He knew he was running out of room. And what did he do? He held it wide open over the wheelie hill and he wheeled himself right off the racetrack. All he had to do was shut the throttle off and he would have recorrected a couple of degrees and made it down the straightaway. He chose to hold it wide open. I didn't do it to him. I didn't put him in that position in the last millisecond. He had a millisecond to decide. He had 10 seconds to decide. He did it to himself. Like, well, that's not how we're looking at it. We're finding you 2,500 bucks. I'm like, whatever. I don't care what you do. So we walk away. Later on that day, they come over and say, hey, man, we really want you racing here. We hope you're not overly mad. You know, I know we find you 2500 bucks. I'm like, dude, whatever. It's no big deal. You didn't even think it through. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, do you not realize the difference between first and second was 5000 bucks? You find me 2500 I'm still 2500 ahead. And they went, oh. <laughs> Right. Yep. It's statistics. It's not how you look at it. Right. I had to win to get the money to do that. I was one of them on my cross 65 feet racetrack. Right. <laughs> so then what started yeah. it was I had been stuffing them going into the last turn. I was doing it on purpose. It was, in, it was in the rain. And I stuffed them like four laps in a row. And I was trying to get them on the last lap to pull the thing over so I couldn't get in the hole. No. And but then he wouldn't get to drive off. And on the last lap I drove around him, he was on 1100. I was on my super bike, my 750. And that's exactly what happened. But then, which I didn't realize until I watched the video, when he realizes I'm going around him, he jumps in the throttle, it lights off the rear tire. And when he shuts the throttle off, the motorcycle jumps left. Well, I just see him come left like a banshee, like to hack me off. So I took it as, he's trying to cut me off, and it was instant, gloves off. Fuck you, this ain't happening. And I mowed him across the racetrack. So I had a reason for doing it. But when I watched the video, come to find out it wasn't the right reason. Yeah, you don't have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on a, on a more uh, business note, tell us a little bit. You, you, you've you ran privateer teams, you've been a privateer. Uh, a little bit on the trials and tribulations there. It's um, it's really simple. We're a traveling circus. Our job is to entertain. That's what it's about, right? You, they, you both have talked about it during the show at some point, that when we go to the racetrack, we're supposed to talk to the fans and put on a show, right? And I'm the action pack guy. I make it happen that... I do whatever I need to do to get to wherever I need to go and get out the other side. And you do it by playing the percentages, right? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you play in the percentages. And because of that, people on the outside, it's like, man, this, this kid is just a blast to watch. He's, he's always up front. He's always motivated. I mean, he's always working on something. He's always trying to make it better. He's got like every Avenue covered. And he tells good stories. 
that we got to sign up. We got to be on board. Right. And that's mm-hmm. how I pay for it. That even at 63 years old, they still sign up because I'm still the action back guy. Right. That's what you need to do. And to acquire the money, it's, you need to be willing to ask, right? Let them say no. I don't care if it's a local body shop. If the guy's doing good and get a good business, you know, there's some way he can help you. Will he paint the bikes for free? You'll put his name on it, right? And you'll give him some pit passes and you'll have him in the press and you'll do YouTube videos, right? With him associated to it, whatever it takes. That's what you need to do. Yeah. So you're at the same time, fundraiser, business owner, coach, head mechanic. I mean, how do you manage all these jobs? And I'm probably missing a couple. But it's the average day, right? Which is what you do. I don't, I don't know any different. It's the average day. I can go from a business meeting on one sense to two seconds later, I'm riding coaching someone that won't hold it wide open. I'm trying to get it out of their head to get them to do something. The two seconds after that, I'm down the engine shop at Kobe Adams place working on an exhaust system that we got the best exhaust systems in the country for the 400s for forever. We had the best exhaust system um, to do in that, but it's just staying. I don't want to say focused because I'm never focused, but whatever I'm doing, I'm doing a hundred percent at that particular moment, get the most I possibly can out of it. Would you trade it for a factory team? I would have liked this shot. Not so much of the, it's not the factory team I wanted a shot at. What I really wanted a shot at was having the right pieces and the right mechanic with me to see what we could have done with it. Like you're asking the question as a factory team that they're God almighty. And I don't look at it that way. They have more resources than I had, right? Because they're, let's just use Kawasaki. Kawasaki in 1993 has a ZX-7R, but they started building it in 1990. We just didn't get it till 1993. So for three Mm -hmm. years, they've been refining it in Japan. We just didn't get it. So when the season starts, they already have works cams and works gearboxes and works clutches and know which carburetors to run. And I mean, all that stuff is already sorted. I get the bike in freaking end of December and maybe middle of February in the first week of March, I get it in Daytona. Right. So I had to get wheels mounted to it, brakes mounted to it. Nobody makes anything. I'm next day in wheels out to California to Cosman to get rotors made because he doesn't know the bolt pattern or the spacing, right? You're getting that done, then I'm making rear sets with my uncle at the machine shop, and then I'm trying to do whatever I can motor-wise, and you're running two intake cams in the thing, right? You're buying something else, so it makes a little more power because you can't buy cams yet. You're doing all you can in two weeks. Right. You know, go to Daytona, so you're already 20 points behind before the season even starts for the first race is over because the factory guys run up front and you're at 10th, right? There's no possible way you can beat them. They showed up with the stuff they've been working on for three years. So mm-hmm. that's why, what I would have liked to have had, I would have liked to have the shot to have the pieces to go. I, I have a, a good, this is a good, stupid story. Good, stupid story is Kawasaki's building the motors. Muzzy's team is building the motors. I did everything else. So I was Dunlop, they were Michelin. Uh, no, I was Michelin, they were Dunlop. I was um, Fox Rear Shock, they were Olin's. So you couldn't go ask them questions, right? Because everything I had was different than what they had. But they were building the motors. We get to Charlotte and Muzzy walks by and says, um, hey, we're having a problem. Like, what's that? We're, we're scoring some of the pistons. The the skirts are growing too much. And you might have one of them. I'm like, okay, well, what about the spare motor? Well, we already used it. 
I'm like, what do you mean you already used it? It's my spare motor. Well, not really. It's ours. We lease it to you. I'm like, yeah, which makes it mine. So, well, whatever. We oh. already used it. I'm like, okay, well, what do you want me to do? Well, I don't know. Probably the best we can do is we'll put up, you know, last week's piston and cylinders on it. I'm like, okay, well, who's going to do it? Well, we don't know because we're too busy. I'm like, so you're saying I need to do it? And he said, basically, I'm like, okay, well, I don't have a problem with doing it, I guess, but I don't have a problem with doing it. It's the point that you have my lease motor. This is BS, but I'll do it. So I ripped the thing apart and it scored the small end of one of the rods a little because the piston's dragging. So I'm looking at it and there's no way I'm taking the whole motorcycle apart. And all we got is the main event tomorrow. This is at the end of Saturday's practice. So I send the mechanic down to the parts store and we get a piece of three foot quarter inch, uh, five sixteenths, no quarter inch um, threaded rod. We come back, I cut a foot off of it, and I set it, I got a vice grip to the trailer hitch, and I take the hacksaw and I cut a slot in it. And he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, don't worry about it. So I cut like a one inch slot in it, and I take the emery cloth, and I put it in the slot, and I wrap it around until it's the size of the wrist pin hole. And I spray it with WD-40, and now the, the motor's together, and it's in the frame, and it's the inside rod. And I got the, the mechanic holding the rod by hand. And I've got this one foot long piece of threaded rod stuck in the drill with emery cloth wrapped around it, stuck in the small end of the rod, spraying it with WD-40. And I'm honing it from the outside with a drill with WD-40. And Muzzy walks by. And he looks over and he starts swearing, what the F are you doing? And he walks over and he can't believe what I'm doing. And of course... Now, this is the angle issue might have played a role. It's probably 8.30 at night. I'm exhausted because I drove 14 hours to get there. I worked my ass off for two days. Now I'm rebuilding the motor. It's 8 o'clock at night. And he's yelling at me. And I, my answer was, I shouldn't be working on the effing thing anyways. I have a fucking lease motor. And he uh, 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 and walks away, comes back a couple of minutes later and throws down a head gasket, walks away again. We put it all back together. And I'm off a little on the cams. He wants 105, I'm 104 and a half. He happens to be walking by again. And I yell over, hey, I'm 104 and a half on the intake cam. Is that close enough? And he yells back, do you sit on half a toilet seat? <laughs> <laughs> I took that as a no, so I fixed it. And I went out the next day, I finished third, they finished fifth. Wow. So I, nice. beat, I beat him with that motor that I fixed by hand the next day. So he he seems them. to have a lot of free time on his hand, walking back and forth in the pits. He was, yeah, he was, <laughs> I can't believe he was doing it. He was going to the pots washer. He was helping the mechanics out. He was going washing pots and bringing them back. But he had to walk by me to do it. So that's why he kept walking back and forth. And he was actually working. Where, where yeah. is he? Is he still in California? Is, is Feria or yeah, one of those? Still, the, they lost the exhaust company. The Something happened in the front office. Hmm. Um, money disappeared. He lost the exhaust company. He's just retired at this point. The auction did all off. So okay. I don't think he's doing anything. Yeah, because I remember him being in the middle of really freaking nowhere in California. Nobody yeah, went there. Yeah, 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 he's in the middle of the desert, yeah. basically. Yeah. So, unlike me, I can't afford to retire. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't want to. <laughs> yeah, even if I did, I can't afford to. <clears throat> and now my son's trying to do the car, so I really can't afford to. <laughs> It does get expensive. Yeah. Well, you know, your son should be your retirement plan. Hey, want me to go get him? Yeah. Just... Alex, <laughs> no. he wants to talk to you. <laughs> He's not coming over. He's shaking his head. <laughs> this is a nice shop you have behind you. Uh, I'll bring you on tour. He wants to know how much money you're going to spend this year. As much as I 
have to. <laughs> Whatever it takes. But but the old man Santa says he can't retire because of you. Yeah, he wasn't planning on retiring anyways. That's his fault, not mine. <laughs> That's, that's, that's a tweet like that you spend in it. Yeah. It's basically that way. I did the same thing to my father. So I can't, I, I have a hard time yelling about it. I feel like the podcast went sideways. It always, <laughs> we're having fun now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, uh, what's the difference in writing between a guy like you that's 190 pounds and a guy like Miguel that's 150 after lunch? About six miles an hour. Six miles an hour. Okay. If you, I can do things he can't do. He can do things I can't do. Um, I can make it do stuff that it doesn't want to do. He needs it to do what it's supposed to do because he can't muscle it. Right. But he has six miles an hour on me at the end of the straightaway. Right. You, know, you go look at any big track. I can't run with those guys. Even drafting them. I can't run with those guys. And you, but you get to mid Ohio, Sonoma, those plaques, then I can run with them. Right, because then it's there's no top speed involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can't use that excuse in Chakwala, girl. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you coming, Chakwala? Next uh, week. I've been there. I have been there once, but I haven't ridden on it. Oh, okay. I, I think N Nabil, are you coming? It's a. I don't know. It's next I'll week. Have to check my flights and everything. Yeah. He's gonna go flights. try his new riding style. N Nabil. Up over down. Yeah, I got a. I got a whole booklet of notes here. Wait, on, up over you down. Know, That's all you need to know. Up, up over, over down. and down. And then uh, drag strips connected by turns. Right. That will never leave us. So you're all set. <laughs> Two seconds a lap. Send me Watch a check on Monday. Drop. Yep. For a second. Yep. What else can I help you guys with before we go back to work? Uh, nothing. You got any more questions? I build? think it's been great. Yeah. Uh, no, no. I mean, uh, anything else you want to share, Dale? It's it, it's been a fantastic session. With yeah. You, do you want to thank? Do you want to thank your sponsors? I have a killer sponsor. Um, I didn't think you asked. You guys want to go on tour for a second? Sure. Yeah. Um. You'll have to describe a bit for the people who don't watch the videos. Yeah, we're also on YouTube, but we don't have any viewers on YouTube for some reason. That's just. Like I hate to do this live, but Alex, that's what I do. You hear how I say it? Alex, that's <laughs> what he knows I want him now. We're not live, so you can curse as much as you want. Can you flip the screen so I'm looking at what. How'd you do it? So I'm looking. I want to look out. <laughs> there you go. Right. There we go. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So we basically have a motorcycle section. So my 400 half together. I'm working on Dylan's Rotex. Um, what's it? J&M frame? Yep, J&M. J&M frame Rotex. I got my wow. vintage Knight uh, TT 500 that we're in the middle of working on. We've got some Zazuka leathers um, that I can't even get my hips in anymore hanging up. Um, over here, we've got some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle stuff. <laughs> zoom in that a little. Absolutely, that we yeah. can zoom in. I got the Bermuda suit still. We've got the yeah, I see it. ZX7 pictures, you know, some club race pictures. Um, we were the first ones to have the fan club, the speed reader club. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, which was cool. Is my this is the first race car victory, which is kind of cool. Nice. So we've got some, um, you know, championship trophies, um, stuff, my Ninja Turtle dude still. And then the race cars, you know, back down. So the race car, you asked about the sponsor. Van Dyke is um, out of Connecticut. 
they import recycling equipment. So when you throw away your paper bottles and cans, this is they import the systems to sort it. And then we've been signing mm. on new sponsors. ACI is a electrical engineering company. Um, Fire Rover does fire suppression systems. They're they're huge and they specialize in complicated systems. Um, we got our favorite right motel on board in the shop. We've got my dirt car, new road race car. Um, oh, wow. A 400 motor that just came in for some of the rebuild. We've got machines, my engine pile, basically two LS motors, um, one LS steel block 396 Ilmo motor. They make 600 horse, um, spare motor just to have a spare, you know, nine million exhaust systems. We've got our motorcycle pile. We've got my wow. vintage GPZ 1100 that we play with. Oh, All nice. um, specialty, you know, like we yeah. make the rear sets cover, make this cool stand dampener mount. We made the triple clamps. We made the brake rotor carriers. This whole bike was made in 12 days. Terry right. Andrew built the engine. When it got here, and 12 days later, we brought it to Bobber. It was 15 for 15 up until uh, two years ago. This is the last time I rode it. Um, the valve cover cracked in the race, and I get beat. And then over here is our pile we haven't got to yet. A couple of flat track bikes. Uh Training TT, my original 84 GPZ getting ready to be rebuilt. Uh, we're going to try and bring that to Barbara this year and ride it. Wow. So there's, there's 9 million things going on here. So, and then I've got a whole parts room out front. They've got a machine shop out back. Um, we can basically do almost anything here. Um, if I can't do it, I've got some buddies that can do it. My son's mechanical engineer, so he can draw. So I've got a, you know, bridge port, oh, wow. miller machine, complete lathe, all the tools, you know, machine box, all the spares, I mean, you name it, we have it. Wow. You're, you're fully so, stocked. I, you have no else. idea how much stuff I have. If I, <laughs> uh, I'm a major overachiever <laughs> <laughs> if i'm gonna if i'm gonna do it i'm all in or i'm not doing it well and it's not for shows because it shows in the numbers yeah yeah okay i'm shall... trying to figure out how to flip the screen but shall we shall we finish the podcast um yeah, yeah, with an yeah. invitation of right. people who are listening yeah. to hop on YouTube and actually have a tour. Yeah, thank, thank you, that Dale. Was fun. Yeah, thank you, Dale, Dale. For I think I think we went over two hours. We we usually try to make it one hour, but we always fail. Yeah, I think we just uh, lost him. Yeah, I think we lost him. So, uh, thank you guys for listening uh, to another episode of Edge Grip Podcast, and uh, we hope you enjoy.